once more into the breach, dear meanies. Do you get the reference, anybody? What's that? No, dear meanies. The Beatles. <laughs> Yellow Submarine. <laughs> Gee, come on, you guys. <laughs> That's evidence, that's evidence of how powerful he was and how important. All right, here goes. Why is it taking so long for the Academy to deal with the authorship question? It's really so obvious that a man from William of Stratford's background, from a 16th century town, three days ride by horseback, from England's only big city, simply could not have written the works of Shakespeare. Why the lie? And why has it lasted so long? One thing is certain, attacking the English departments has been a waste of time. They arrived too late to the Shakespeare game to do anything but continue to turn in tight little circles around the kind of issues that are all their peculiar brand of philology will allow. No, our problem is with the history departments. Until we understand that and the true immensity of the question, we will never get anywhere. Now, why is that so? Because while the English departments care nothing about Oxford or William or any author, the history department does care about Oxford because it hates him. <laughs> it has hated him for centuries. It regards him as a pampered brat who did nothing but waste his family inheritance and insult that kindly old gentleman, Lord Burley. <laughs> Alan Nelson is only the most recent in a long stream of historians who've been egregiously slamming Oxford for centuries. Forty years before Nelson, sociologist Lawrence Stone labeled Burley's wards an antipathetic group of superfluous parasites. <laughs> and Oxford, the greatest wastrel of them all. Now part of this is the Earl's own fault. Following his return from Italy in 1576, he effectively disappeared from history. Focused on building theaters and giving actors work, he did what he could to stay out of range for the Puritans and evangelicals whose passionate belief that making and watching plays was a slippery slope leading to eternal damnation. It's no joke. That is what he was facing. Though his name pops up now and then in the Revels records and court calendar, these seem purely accidental. None of this, however, goes anywhere near explaining why every biographer, journalist, or novelist who has ever mentioned his name in passing has paired it with some nasty pejorative, such as the obnoxious Earl of Oxford, the violent Earl of Oxford, the dissolute, feckless, atheistic, profligate, arrogant, supercilious, spoiled, pathologically selfish, <laughs> ill-tempered, disagreeable <laughs> Earl of Oxford. To the early stage historian C.W. Wallace, he was a swaggerer, roisterer, brawler. To Burley's biographer Conyers Reed, he was a cad, a renegade, an unwhipped cub. <laughs> To literary historian A.L. Rouse, he was the insufferable, light-headed Earl of Oxford. Light-headed. <laughs> to Alan Nelson, he was, and doubtless still is, notorious, insolent, sinister, a mongrel. <laughs> this last because his mother wasn't a thoroughbred aristocrat. <laughs> Some of this mistreatment began in his own lifetime. We know this from the sonnets, where he speaks of himself as in disgrace with fortune in men's eyes. And because in the version of Hamlet published while he was still alive, the dying protagonist begs his friend, oh good Horatio, 
What a wounded name, things standing thus unknown, shall live behind me. What things unknown? As all are aware who have delved into what E.K. Chambers calls the Shakespeare problem, there are entire periods, whole sequences of events that are missing from history. One of these is the truth about Shakespeare's identity. Another is a satisfying account of the creation of the London stage. With both of these, it's as if a film about the moon landing goes from the planning stage to the return from space with nothing to show what took place in between. Chambers' only acknowledgement of these blanks in his great four-volume compendium, as uh, revealed about London stage, is the arcane Latin term lacunae. All we have for today, time for today, is a close look at one important moment, and for that, just the briefest of outlines. We'll begin in the spring of 1590 with the death of the then Secretary of State, Sir Francis Walsingham. History's version of Walsingham, that he had no interest in the stage, is simply a flat-out lie. He actively fostered it through the 1580s. Why then, as soon as he was gone, did it begin to suffer the setbacks that came close to destroying it? The only possible answer is the return by Lord Burley to running the office that he had created during the Queen's first decade and the fact that he brought with him his son Robert, who helped with those aspects of the job that his aging father could no longer fulfill. Among these, it seems, was an attempt to control or destroy the stage what could be described as the first solid manifestation of the fourth estate of government, what today we call the media. As recorded by the Rebels' account for the winters of 1590 through 93, the companies that had entertained the court every winter for a decade, Paul's boys, the Lord Admiral's men, and the Queen's men, were dropped one by one from the roster. <clears throat> With their loss of the court's business, some of these companies were forced to break and their actors to take off to the continent in hopes of finding work. When Burley's attempt to get the popular playwright Christopher Marlowe incarcerated on a trumped up charge of counterfeiting failed in 1592, his brutal murder by government agents in 1593 was blamed on Marlowe himself make certain that no one would bother to investigate, a team of disinformation operatives were put to work creating documents that defamed his character, a defamation that has lasted to this day. The following year came the murder of his patron, Ferdinando Lord Strange, recently raised to fifth Earl of Derby, to, of all women, Oxford's daughter. The marriage arranged by Burley gave the Cecils the entry into the upper peerage that had been denied them by Oxford's failure to provide Anne Cecil with a healthy son. And so, as the footlights were lit and the young Richard Burbage hunched over, oh, wait a minute, wrong, 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 skipping a page. I wasn't going to do that. This brings us to 1596, <clears throat> the year the Queen finally gave in and appointed Robert Secretary of State. Two weeks later, Lord Chamberlain Hunston, creator of the Lord Chamberlain's Men, the company that was meant to replace the companies disbanded by the Cecils, died unexpectedly following a healthy dinner. Two weeks after Hunston's death, his office as Lord Chamberlain was given to Cecil's father-in-law, Burley's main supporter, William Brooke Lord Cobham, which put him on the Privy Council thus giving control of the council to the Cecils. By October, the council had been persuaded by Elizabeth Russell, Robert's aunt, Burley's sister-in-law, to prevent the Burbages from opening their elegant new theater in her bailiwick, the Liberty of Blackfriars. The following February, James Burbage, creator of the first public stage in London and father of the team that led the Lord Chamberlain's men, was also dead. When Cecil was informed the following May that he was the butt of a play being performed at a new theater by a company made up of actors from those he had forced to disband, he ordered all the theaters in London closed for the rest of the summer. 
he would have to allow them to reopen in October because that's when the government would see upwards of 500 parliamentarians from all over England pouring into Westminster for the Queen's ninth parliament, hungry for the kind of entertainment that they could find only in the nation's capital. Cecil could not afford to displease these important constituents by keeping the theaters shuttered, so all the theaters reopened in October. That is, all but two, one of them the Burbage's 20-year-old public stage. It remained permanently closed. With no theater in which to perform, no court patron to protect them, their manager dead, their livelihoods at stake, the Lord Chamberlain's men turned to the one thing they had left, their playwright. Faced with the destruction of the industry he had created, and with the loss of contact with what by then must have been an immense public audience, an immense public audience, with all these public theaters going in a small city most of the year, Oxford called once more on his muse of fire, revising his old true tragedy of Richard III into the brutally humorless play we know today as Richard III. With no theater available, the company probably arranged to perform it in the hall of one of London's great manors. The court was used to Robert Cecil's deformity, his spindly little legs, hunched back, and crooked neck. Born with a serious form of the scoliosis that touched so many members of his mother's family, Robert had borne the slings and arrows of the cruel jests that came his way in a court ruled by the queen's delight in long-legged, handsome men. But the parliamentarians from the north and west of England had probably never seen Robert Cecil in person until he dressed them in Parliament as the Queen's new representative. And so, as the footlights were lit and the young Richard Burbage, hunched over and garbed all in black, entered the darkened room, the audience of MPs and court regulars gasped to see the image of their new Secretary of State. Mimicking Cecil's lurching gait, speaking in accents modeled on the voice they had been hearing every day in Parliament, they listened with astonished horror as he mouthed the opening lines. Very famous to anyone who knows that play. I that am rudely stamped, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up. Words written by one who had been present at his birth and had seen his early struggles to survive because he was living at Cecil House when Robert was born. Despite the lack of hard evidence that this is what must have happened is the only possible explanation for what would follow. Before the arrival of the MPs in October, someone had seen to it that the revised version of the true tragedies was made available in quarto. However prepared by the text, what the audience would not have been prepared for was the visual identification of the evil king with their new Secretary of State. There is nothing in the published play to suggest. Only those who had seen it with their own eyes would have made the connection. And with no record of the performance but hearsay, how could anyone prove that the comparison with Cecil was intentional or anything but the viewer's naughty imagination? That the play created a firestorm of scandalized commentary court and in London may not be a matter of record. <laughs> you won't find it in the record. But it is suggested by the fact that a second edition of the play was published within weeks of the Christmas break, one with exactly the same text as the first, except that the phrase by William Shakespeare had been added to the title page. Thus was the name Shakespeare launched to an eternity of fame and misidentification. When life at court continued as though undisturbed, 
and the Lord Chamberlain's men and Lord Admiral's men continued to entertain over the winter holidays, and Robert Cecil continued to advise the Queen as though nothing had happened. It must have seemed to many that Robert had managed to survive the blow perpetrated by the Lord Chamberlain's men. There was, however, one who continued to feel it, and that most painfully, namely Robert Cecil. Having proven himself a master of the dark arts by the success of the sting with which he had destroyed Marlowe and his reputation, Cecil's campaign to destroy the London stage and its creator <clears throat> was to have been the ultimate demonstration to his enemies that he was indestructible. That in the final showdown, Oxford had beaten him and that the world, or that part of it that mattered, knew it, left Cecil with a great thirst for revenge against Oxford and all that he had created. Having learned from his father how he who owns the record owns history, once Cecil reached the level of power under James that gave him access to every record in the nation, can we doubt that he took advantage of it? Can we imagine that having the power to eliminate everything about the London stage, along with everything that connected it to his hated brother-in-law, can we imagine that he failed to use it? Having no other weapon with which to wound him, can we doubt that he did so? What other explanation can there be for Chambers' lacunae, the great gaps that appear in the record where there ought to be notes about the stage? The only persons in a position to do that were the Cecils, who between them, except for the decade and a half that Walsingham held the post, a post of secretary, had control of it for half a century. What other explanation can there be for the barrage of, of pejoratives that has attended any mention of the Earl of Oxford from that day to this? That Robert Cecil failed to do to Oxford what he had done to that other pesky playwright, Christopher Marlowe. He who controls the record controls history. Hatfield House, home to the Cecils and their descendants ever since Robert acquired the property from King James, has also been the permanent home of the archives from the Tudor period, as collected by the Cecils over the half century that they controlled the record. For 400 years, scholars acquiring access to original documents from the Tudor and Jacobean period have had to apply for permission to study these in the library at Hatfield House under the watchful eye of their librarian as other household archives ended up in the British Museum or the Public Record Office, those gathered by Burley and his son have remained for the centuries under their family's control at Hatfield House. Only since 2003, with the creation of the National Archives and the presence of the internet, has direct access to these been made readily available. Long after the original Cecils were gone, generations of Robert's descendants have served on boards and committees whose goal has been to oversee the writing of an acceptable English history. Can we doubt that these have been partly driven as a means of protecting the good name of Salisbury and diminishing anything that might threaten to damage it with an ugly truth? In his 1973 memoir about his family, Lord David Cecil repeats the version of Oxford that the Cecils have been telling each other and the nation ever since. It's all there, including the accusations of pedophilia, which means that generations of Cecils and those following the paper trails they left to history have all been aware of the Howard Arundel libels long before Alan Nelson published them. There is a nasty quality to these offhand slurs that reflects the tone of the terms used to destroy gay men during the 19th century when England writhed in the grip of its horrific epidemic of homophobia, a story that has barely reached beyond what it did to Lord Byron and Oscar Wilde. 
What it did to Oxford's reputation is an important chapter in this story. It was during that same century, century that William Cecil's lifetime goal, the raising of a humble family to the peak of power, was finally and gloriously achieved when the third Marquess of Salisbury, another Robert Cecil, became Queen Victoria's longest ruling prime minister and the major power behind the phenomenon we call the British Empire. The grand irony here is that this Cecil's economic and political might spread the English language and its literature around the world, taking with it the works of Shakespeare, including, of course, his Richard III an irony that Oxford would surely have appreciated it had he been around to see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.